presentation on writs and procedures. The reason we are doing this is because there seems to be a real disconnect between what happens in the trial court and what we as writ attorneys write for our officers. What I wanted to do first is just to give you an idea of the different thinking, because there is actually different thinking that goes on between what happens in court and what we do when we write briefs. I read a, um, a book by Michael Lewis called The Undoing Project, wherein Michael Lewis is the same one who wrote The Big Short and um, Moneyball, and a couple other books. But in this one, he explains the partnership between psychologist Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, whose work on heuristics and psychology um, examined judgment and decision making and demonstrated common errors in the human psyche as they do so. That comes in really handy, and so I gave you at least a copy. I hope you got the color one. It's 20 cognitive biases that screw up decision making. We're talking about biases of the bench as well as decisions on what kind of evidence to present during the hearing. Um, basically, the difference is this. Um, I hear a lot of people, and when I read with reporters' transcripts, speak about the story of the client or telling a client's story, kind of as a countermeasure to what's written in the reports that are prepared by the Department of Children and Family Services board that are all admitted into evidence. I'm waiting for Ryan Cassidy. So, anyway, what what becomes really important in the narrative, as I want to show you how it's different from what we do on appeals and writs. Thanks to Google, there there are just basically three types of narrative elements. Um, there's a collection of the and, that is, we collect facts about your client, we try to paint a picture of them um, and that everyone can sort of agree on. Then comes the second element, the but fours, where you learn of all of the things that may change that initial picture. And then comes the therefore stage, which is the conclusion. You see them, the same thing used in political campaigns. You know, we have the vision of what America was, and then we complain about the dreamers and people who are here undocumented, like Trump did, it's a perfect example. And then the therefore is we're going to make America great again. It's the same kind of narrative that our brains just seem to follow. We like to tell stories, that's how we learn. What happens in court, though, is that and why I mentioned the book, again, Doing Project, is what happens with all of those facts is that the court gets to pick and choose from among them. The more facts we present at court about who our client is and what they do, add to the total of all the facts that the social worker also puts in evidence. That the more facts, it gives the court the opportunity to exercise the biases that screw up the decision making. By putting in there too much, you really don't necessarily do a whole lot for your clients. Um, and what we do in appeals is more, rather than that narrative formula, 
we give a sort of more of an if-then kind of approach. We look at the elements of the statute, the elements of the cause of action in the 300, and we identify exactly what it is that we need information on. Our job is, as lawyers for the parents is to find enough information to show that there is not sufficient support for the trial court's judgment because the appellate court gives the trial court all the benefit of the doubt as long as inferences are reasonable but for substantial evidence and abuse of discretion review standards come in. This is the best example I found of that in recently reading transcripts. Um, what happened is that mother was at the 12 month review, regularly visiting her child. Things were going great. She was doing what she should as far as attendance and counseling. She regularly went. She seemed to be making progress from the letters being written. The supervising social worker at the 12 month review report added this little gem that although mother was seemingly making progress, she still believed that the beater father, if you will, was making good progress in his parenting classes and that someday they'd all be back together as a family. That single sentence was glommed onto by the court at the 18 month review, which because of continuances that come with setting things over for context, uh, the court glommed onto that and said that currently, even though mom seems to be doing well, she still doesn't understand why the case came to the court in the first place. And it, it just pretty much defeated her. When we look at that type of thing in the transcripts, and all we see is parents' counsel coming forward with, in this case, it was actually a really good examination of their own client, but just with information about progress in counseling, getting along with the kid, they ignored that portion of the report from 12 months. The Court of Appeal will look, and their research attorneys should read this stuff first, look at the entire record. So do we as the writ attorneys. If that was missed, that just ended any chance we have really to bring forth a decent writ on behalf of the client. So when you look at this, I just want you to think about the biases that screw up our decisions. Yeah. Um, okay, any questions so far? That's why when we pound on people about reading statutes and cases, even the unpublished ones really need to do that. More simply then, I did have this three little page uh, summary on written appeals. The idea of having all this paper for you is that you get back to the office, you can tear it apart, you can put it in a file folder, and look at it later, you know, if you want to. Okay. Um, but I want to introduce to you as well, more practically, of the mechanics of filing the notice of intent. The appellate challenge to findings of origin in any hearing at which the juvenile court orders the setting of a permanent final hearing can be made at the or raised by the filing of the notice of intent. Without the filing of the notice of intent, there is a forfeiture of all the issues that could have been examined on appeal. You can't then go ahead and raise them later on an appeal after parental rights are terminated. Following a disposition is when the party files an appeal. The notice of intent of filed once the court finds and declares the child the defendant of the court. And at that hearing, you can challenge both jurisdictional as well as dispositional issues, unless they're forfeited. Also, any time from the review hearings thereafter, you file a notice of intent when you wish to challenge anything that happened at that proceeding. Similarly, a notice of intent to file a petition for extraordinary writ must be filed in all cases involving decisions to remove a child from a specific placement in the home of a prospective adopted parent. That's the other kind of statutory writ we usually see. That's under 366.28B1. Okay. So practically, 
what happens in court is the court will advise the clients of their rights. So while he's taking his water break, so in your packet somewhere, in all of your documents, this is the first document that he's describing. Everybody should be familiar with this. Hopefully this is not the first time that you've seen this document. So it's the paper that needs to be filed with the Superior Court to let them know that you perhaps have an issue with the order setting the 2-6 hearing and everything else that came before it. So this is the first document. Okay. Um, that's either handed out in court or mailed to a client later. But the oral advisement requirement comes in California Rules of Court 5.590B1. You need to understand that there are rules of court as well as any other statutes are divided into two types. There are those that are obligatory and those that are permissive. There are two subsets. Court. Yes. Hello. Yes. Can you hear us? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Sure. Okay. Anyway, so the court in has held that in the case called Hannah D, a 2017 case at 9 Cal App 5th, 662, the, the oral advisement that's required is merely directory. That means that even if the court has to give it, its failure to give an oral advisement is not needed as long as the client gets a written advisement. So if they pass something out in court, that's advisement enough. The court doesn't have to take time and orally get the advisement when a client's present. Um, there's another case, Katina W. from 1998, at 68 Cal App 4, 716. That was the case in which there was a complete failure to give any timely notice at all. The mother was not present, but she also had a good address, and the clerk failed to send any notice to her. In that case, and that's one of the only ones that you can raise any issues that could have been raised on the, from the order referring the case to a 2-6 at the time of a subsequent appeal following termination of parental rights. Okay. There's another case. That I, I know it's not listed in the materials out. That's, you can write it down, hopefully. In Ray AA from 2016 at 243 Calab 4th, 1220. There, the mother's failure to challenge the setting order by filing a petition for extraordinary writ um, was excused because the juvenile court did not provide adequate notice un under the rules of the mother's right to file a writ petition when the clerk sent a tardy notice of mail. So not giving the advisement in court, not giving the paperwork out, but if they have the parents not there, but if there's an address to send to, that is an excuse for not timely filing the notice of intent. And then when there was another case, which I know has happened to us all from 2013 called In Re AH, the 218 Cal Up 437, there, the parents became upset at an 18-month review hearing and walked out after the judge warned them that the hearing would proceed if they left. They did anyway because they were angry. Um, consequently, they didn't receive an oral advisement or written advisement or written review. The clerk had mailed the packet, an informational packet out to them, but there wasn't a good address. And they hadn't given a good address on the 316.1, which is one of the requirements for keeping the court updated on notice. And so they were denied the opportunity when they came back later to say we never got notice, so we want to raise all the issues that could have been raised at the time of the order setting the 2 6 hearing. Are there any questions so far? These are just permutations of parents present, present, parents not present. The best practice is just to keep a good address for your client to make sure that the address at least is updated for the court is the best remedy to deal with these issues. 
So who must sign the notice? That's been an issue. When once upon a time, under, there was a case called Lisa S. Um, Division Five had it in our district, and looking at other reports, they said the attorney has to file. It cannot just sign and file the writ. The writ has to be the notice of intent needs to be filed, signed by the client. Um, the only excuse was when good cause was shown, not that the attorney could file a company declaration saying my client talked to me and wanted to file a writ. What that happened was a need for the attorney to express that because the client was in jail, the client couldn't give you know, sign the writ themselves, or they were living out of state, um, so the client could file the writ by themselves. The rule changed in 2008, January, and now the attorney, and you'll see on the new forms, the attorney can check the box off and sign for the client. My advice is, unless you have permission from your client, and you make a notation in your file, don't do it. They the court looks at this statutory right, it's belonging to the client, and it's their obligation to step forward and to challenge the orders that were, and findings that were made at the proceeding in which the order setting the two suits was made. So if you note your file, you know, the client wants something to do with anything, and then unless they're calling you and telling you that you want something filed, um, I don't think you're under any obligation to file something because you think that there's an issue. You should stop your client from leaving too early, spend five minutes with them, talk to them about what an appeal is or what a writ is, and see if that's something you want to pursue. You also should be talking to your clients about what your feeling is about writ issues and whether you think that there's anything to, to really challenge. Just to do it for the purpose of doing it um, is why we file you know, blank C's. That comes not from the attorneys nearly as much as it comes from the client signing. Because I think what's happened now is that they all talk among themselves in the waiting area about 388s, we know that. But now they're also talking about notices of intent, thinking that this is a new bite at the apple for them. You need to dispel them of that notion that this is an appeal or the appellate court looks at it. They're only looking at the record from, from the transcripts. There's, there's nothing else we can, we can do for them. They just have a cold record to look at. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. I just want to rewind one more time compared sure. to the court's obligation to inform the client. Yes. Um, when there's a termination of the invitation and they set the two cents. I've had attorneys ask me this question. Um, we've had a contested T2 theory. It was a righteous one, but the court probably had sufficient grounds to terminate FR. But what the court fails to do is because they're moving very fast and they kind of forget to give the notice, and they kind of forget to give the client the notice of intent. What do we do? Okay. Um, you can still talk to your client. You can let them know what's going on. The failure to give the advisement plus the failure to send out the packet, because the clerk won't automatically do it if the client's there, may well allow them to raise similar issues. Um, but from the appeal, say it from termination later. It's unclear though, if there's an attorney there with them, who, and we have an obligation under 6880 or 6830 of the Business and Professions Code to give it, to advise them. We certainly have the obligation to write a writ for them, which comes in the case of Ray Glenn C, or Glenn C versus Superior Court. And, that's why the offices have writ attorneys. Um, it's part of an obligation to write something on their behalf, but um, it's that question just isn't answered by case law yet. But I would certainly yeah, yeah. but um, you know, it, it's it what, may not, what I'm saying. Practically speaking, talk to your client. Legally, you probably not have to do anything, but you should talk to your client. 
and explain to them what their bid is if they leave. I'd write to them and let them know they have the opportunity. But don't forget, this, when we get into the timing of filing, those are things that really have to be considered. If, if they don't really want to stay and talk to you anymore because they're done with the case, I don't know if there's anything you can do except write them a letter and explain to them what the timing is. You get an extra 10 days if you're in a commissioner's court, then you will just the seven days in a judge's court. But and and I, I would say the, the actual <laughs> oral advisement, just don't even try to you know, harness an argument about the oral advisement. If that client has a good 316.6 or 3.316.1 address, and the clerk is already required to send out that notice, it's good, it's done. It's assumed that that notice, plus all the other things that go with filing the writ petition are attached and received by your client. So the oral advisement, I wouldn't spend a lot of time figuring that there's a writ issue here because my client didn't get the writ advisement. I wouldn't do that. One interesting thing, is that for appeals, there's no obligation of the court to give it a right. An appeal can be taken in many hearings. Um, and that's because the rules of court under the advisement section of Rule 5.590 makes it doesn't include the requirement of a court to give an appellate advisement and ex explanation. Um, and probably a client would waive some issues on appeal if they submit, in some cases, like on the recommendation, okay, or submit to the um, enter no contest plea on a jurisdictional hearing. There are rules about that too. So um, be, be cognitive of the fact that you could that you don't want your client to forfeit any rights. But um, you know, know when there's really an obligation, something that's mandatory on our part to do. Okay, any questions? You're doing such a good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So let's talk about um, who must sign. The client can sign. We can sign if we know that the client wants us to. We can file it on their behalf. Where to file? You go to the second floor clerk's office and put it in there. There's a long line. Sometimes I'll let you, you know, as you walk in, there's that side window. Sometimes I'll let you just leave it there on the other side. That happened once, and just once. Um, let's see. And the timing of the filing. Okay. The rules, the statute is 366.26 subdivision L. And it says, see the court rules for the timing of filing. If you're in a courtroom where a judge sits, there are seven days. If the seven, so if it happens on, say, a Friday, Saturday is the first day, Sunday is the second, if your hearing happens on Friday. So it's Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, needs to be done Friday. If the last day, the seventh day, falls on a holiday or a weekend, if the last day falls on a holiday or a weekend, then you get to the next court day to file. But if you know your client wants to sign, you have them sign the notice of intent, um, just put it in that day. It's, it's probably the best practice. If you're in a commissioner's court, you get another 10 days or 17 days to file. The reason for that is because a judge always has to sign off on the minute order from the hearing at which a commissioner or another pro tem sat. Okay. And so you get 10 days because the order isn't official until then. If, the, if there needs to be a mailing, you can get another five days for that. So you can end up from the commissioner's office getting, or commissioner's court, where the client isn't present and they send out the mail, the mail, the notice of intent, you get up to 22 days. And if they're out of state, I think you get 12 days more. So it's, you can get a lot of, you can get some extra time depending on whose court you're appearing in. Okay, all of those 
rules are also set out, and the timetable is set out in the materials we'll get out today. And it's conveniently located on the back of the notice of intent to file writ petition. If you guys are going or if your client is going to the clerk's office and get the, the two side or the two paged one, but it's the second page. So it should be conveniently located. And you guys should start timing the minute that order is made. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If your client was present. If your client wasn't present, then you start following the rules on the back. If your client is incarcerated and on the phone, they're present. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, if your client is incarcerated but wasn't present, but the order was by a referee, then you start doing the math differently, right? You have to really follow these rules. Not present, incarcerated, referee. Do the math. Get as close as you can to start making sure that you've got the time. If you feel like you're off by one day, file it earlier. Don't try to file it at your outside your outside date because you might just miss it. So the sooner the better. I would just stick with seven days. If your client was there or wasn't there, just get it in. Get it in. You don't want to miss it. I had to file a letter with the Court of Appeal trying to beg them to accept what I believe to be and turned out was a meritorious writ petition. I had to file the letter because the notice of intent was filed 19 days after the order was made. So I'm like, okay. So I had to do my, my good cause letter. I set out all of my facts. I had to persuade the court that this was a, 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 a meritorious writ petition. They gave me the green light. So I didn't want to have to do all that. I did it. I was happy to do it, but it was that, you know, the that particular trial attorney went a little bit too far. And fortunately, I was able to interview the attorney. I figured out what, what happened. I came up with some great facts that was sufficient to satisfy good cause. And understand too that what we're talking about is a jurisdictional question, whether the court has the power to address any appellate issues by not filing timely and not having good cause and run into problems. So, so is the lesson, like if you do forget that you think there's a, a meritorious claim, file it anyway? Um, yeah, first, first, just get it, just get yeah, it done. I mean, it might get done, right? Day. Yeah, it, it might get bounced. It might get bounced. Because remember, right. you guys are giving it to the clerks of the Superior Court. Um, they're not always staying on top of everything. They may go ahead and process it. And then you, on the other end, are starting to read the record, getting ready, trying to pick out the issues. And then you realize that the, that the notice was filed late, but the Superior Court didn't catch it. But DCFS might, or Mike's attorney might, when they're filing their answer. So get it in there. If it gets through the radar and we catch it, you might have to do some sort of letter. Also, if you're helping your client fill out the notice of intent, make sure all of the spaces are filled in. Um, really important, sort of having all the kids' names in there, their dates of birth. Really important is the date on which the court made its order, setting the 2-6. And also, listing all the known dates of hearing. If the, if the 2 one f is set over three days, there's only testimony on the last day, but there's some things mentioned, reports are turned in, the court makes comments about the report. Make sure it gets onto the notice of intent, because we end up having to correct the record, and that takes a little extra time. And the problem is you keep these things have to be handled really, really quickly, and you're moving toward the 2-6 day. So make sure everything's filled out. Mm -hmm. Clients usually put their last name, your first name, and the phone number um, of the neighbor when they fill these things out. So it's it's best if you at least supervise them if you don't want your name going up here in the corner. Um, okay, all right. Okay, the Glenn C letter. When we as writ attorneys get everything in front of us and we read all the transcripts, that's when the decision is made. You know, just because the reporter's transcript may be short or the hearing was quick, doesn't mean that there's not an issue. We have to examine all those pages. The clerk's transcripts are anywhere from 600 to 1,600 pages or more that we end up reading as it goes back to the entire history of the case. Um, we have to examine all that. 
Then we decide that the Glen C is the best route, or actually filing a writ petition is the best route. So it's really time consuming. So if we try to talk to you about your case, you know, help us. Help us help you. And that's what we try to do. Um, let's see, Glen C may, we, is the letter that we file, and there's a copy of the sample in there for you. That's, a, that's what we file when we're at a point where there's really no issue, and that's our informing, the filling our obligation as attorneys, letting the appellate court know that we don't find an issue. Um, once that's done, the court really, as in other districts, is really under no obligation to permit the client to file something on their own. Fortunately, the second district does allow the client and will usually give us the 15 extra days we ask for in order for the client to receive the transcript, do what they can with what they have, and file something with the Court of Appeal. Um, just know this, too. This is the last thing I have to say, and then I'll be done because it's getting late. I'm sorry. Um, with Glenn C. makes an interesting point, that constitutionally protected liberty interest that we all talk about, um, our clients and their children wanting to be together, that's really a little more tenuous than the Constitution, than the constitutional issue. As in the case of Tanya M., which was late 1997, the California Supreme Court recognized that as these cases move along, the child's interest is becoming separate from his parents' interest in keeping them. The child's interest is moving toward safe and stable home. So each time the court acting in local parentis and not sending the kid home, the parents are really losing a little more ground. And it becomes really much more difficult to make that up as you get closer to the 12, which is a permanency hearing in the 18 month, which California gives a second permanency hearing, well, a third two under the two five. Any questions? No. Okay, I'm glad I was clear. Okay. And if you do see, see us in the hall, you can always stop and ask us things. Okay. Thank you so much. Now, Nicole. Will so, this issue about the Glen C, just so that you guys can put it all into perspective. So, we're putting the Glen C down on your desks, right? We're giving you a, a copy of the letter that we're sending to, or the explanatory letter at least. Um, that explains that we're not going to be filing the repetition. And just so that you guys can get a better appreciation, so this is an actual notice of intent to file repetition that turned into something that needs to be assessed for repetition. The, the hearing from the, the, that the order was set was on May 9, 2017, but the detention of the child was on August 10, 2015. So I'm not only going to get your client's legal file, right? Because I need to know everything that happened from August 10, 2015, all the way to May 9, 2017. So I'm looking at this. Next, I get the writ record, right, which contains all of the social workers reports. This should match this. So I have to go through every single solitary page of this writ record to make sure it matches. If it does not match, I have to send a letter to the Court of Appeal asking them to correct the record, and that can take some time. In this particular case, I had to do that very thing. I had to request a couple of more transcripts because August 10, 2015, May 9, 2017, two years worth of proceedings that I had to put my brain around and figure out how in the world did this judge get to this order terminating reunification services and setting the two six. It started with the record I got in July. I just recently filed the Glen C in October. It took me that long to assess this record. So when you guys are coming back from a very long day in the courthouse, and you come to your desk and you see the letter from one of us saying, we're not going to be with a brother petition because we know we're too late. It was not taken or it was not done in, in any sort of um, quick review. It was a very lengthy, time consuming page after page after page review of the records, including your, your client file. Um, so 
just appreciate that it's a very, very um, intense review of your file from start to finish. So let's assume, though, that after we have done all of this, we find the issue. We're filing a repetition. I'm going to skip over all the things that need to go inside this repetition, but believe you me, translating this into this is quite a task which if it, just for a minute, when you guys are putting together your client legal file, try your best to make sure that it's all in order, all of your notes are very clear to the best of your ability, because we're only gonna have 10 days to do this. 10 days to do this. So do the best that you can. Now eventually when I get this, I start putting it all together and making it make sense, and I do the timeline and everything like that. But to get to this, it's a, it's a little bit of an effort. Here's the deal. We have filed it. What is the Court of Appeal going to do with it? Now, this actually harkens back to what we're doing when we're looking for the issue the, verse, the first time around. We are looking, and the Court of Appeal is looking, at this record using very specific standards of review. Now. There are four, generally speaking, that the court uses when they are looking through this repetition to figure out whether or not they're going to grant it or deny it. Okay, this is my favorite one. I don't know if it's a favorite one of yours, but I see it time and time and time and time and time again in opinion after opinion after opinion. And this standard review is substantial evidence. They are looking to see if the trial court's order is supported by substantial evidence, they are not looking to see if you made a good argument. They are not looking to try your case, right? Because they're deferential. And here we go. We review, I like to use the voice of what I believe to be the Court of Appeal, collectively speaking. Mine is sort of like a Southern kind of whatever, but something to kind of give me, you know, shake me into my, to, into, into a perspective of what they're doing over there. We review the trial court's findings for substantial evidence. <laughs> we do not reweigh the evidence. We're not going to look at the evidence. We're not going to evaluate the credibility of witnesses or resolve evidentiary conflicts. The judgment will be upheld if it is supported by substantial evidence. Even though <laughs> substantial evidence to the contrary also did. This is what you like, all right? What? I had a good argument. She did all of her case plans. She went to every single solitary visit. She should get her kid back. Well, no. The judgment will be upheld if it is supported by substantial evidence, even though substantial evidence to the contrary also exists, and the trial court might have reached a different result had it believed the other evidence. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. But the thing that I really want to show you is where it says, the appellant, <clears throat> us, you, you have the burden to show there is no evidence of sufficiently substantial nature to support the finding. All right? So this is why you see so many gun C letters. We're looking at the trial court's order to see whether or not there is evidence to support their order. We're not trying your, your client's case. It's not, it's not going to happen because the court of appeal is not going to do it. They're deferential to the trial court's <coughs> ruling. Okay, another standard of review, abuse of discretion. Oh, well, let me give an example of when they would use substantial evidence. They would use substantial evidence to evaluate reasonable services. They would use substantial evidence to, re to review substantial risk of detriment. The bypass provisions, when you guys read a DISPO and it's 361.5B10 or 11, they're using substantial evidence. Another standard of review, abuse of discretion. This is when the trial court has exceeded the limits of legal discretion by making an arbitrary, capricious, or patently absurd determination. They exceed the bounds of reason. But, but when two or more inferences can reasonably deduce from the facts, the reviewing court has no authority 
to substitute its decision for the trial court. Again, deference to the trial court with two or more. Well, the judge chose this one. We're going with it. Petition denied. Petition denied. Here's an example. Deny reunification services to a biological father. Finding detriment to terminate visitation. Some summarily denying a 388 without a hearing. Refusing to even exercise their discretion. That's an abuse of discretion standard of review. De novo. Rarely see it, except we just saw it in In Re RT. De novo. They're looking at everything all over again. This is the one we want, right? We want them. We want them to look it over all over again. Start from detention, go all the way up to termination of communication services, and do the evidence all over again. Clear your mind of what the trial court did. De novo. But only if it's a pure question of law. Pure question of law? Well, what do you mean a pure question of law? My client did her case plan. She visited all her children consistently and regularly. No, 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 no. No, that's evidence. That's substantial evidence. We're talking about a pure question of law. Like, does Section 300B1 require a finding that a parent was neglectful or in some way to blame for the failure or inability to adequately supervise or protect his or her child? That was in Ray RT, California Supreme Court. In Ray RT, they decided... 300B, de novo. They picked it apart. They thought it through. They did all of that historical review to figure out what exactly does 300B1 actually say, de novo. But I mean, how many times are we going to look at de novo when we're looking at substantial detriment? Never. Reasonable services? Never. So de novo. Okay, and last but not least, harmless error. So this is the one where your court did something screwy and did not use the right law. So you're like, this is a, this is a slam dunk, Rick. No, not exactly. If you look at the whole record, had the court used the right law, would they have won? No. Had, had the court actually used the right code section to make this decision, would your, court, would your client have prevailed? No. Harmless error. Rip petition denied. Okay, so this is why you're getting your Gwen C letters. Because all of the standard of reviews are deferential to the trial court. It's very, very difficult to meet all of these burdens. Moving on. Explaining writs to your client. So I put together a handout. I'm hopeful that it is extremely clear. Not only for you, but it's extremely clear for your client and your Spanish speaking clients. And perhaps we can even get it translated into any and other languages. But it's very straightforward because you're coming out of that hearing. Your client is upset. You don't know what to say. They want to file an appeal. You say, Well, you can file a writ. Well, I mean, I'm going to file a writ. Well, you can't really succeed on your writ if you just believe that the evidence is false. That evidence was false. She lied. Not a writ petition. Well, the judge didn't like it to begin with. They never even let my grandma in. Every time we came to the court, that's not a writ petition. Well, you weren't, you weren't standing up for me. You were a bad lawyer. That is not a writ petition. That social worker had it out for me from the very beginning. She never set up my visitation. She didn't even do her job right. That's not a repetition. So I'm about to finish my parenting class. And I have one more week to go in my drug treatment program. And I'm getting my certificate just to go downtown right now. And I have to write a check because I'm just behind in my payment. So if I have that evidence, that's not a writ petition. So if you feel the need to talk to your client. And I really encourage you to talk to your client about these writ petitions. You might want to have this handy. And you might want to, as they start talking about why they want an appeal, well, no, no, it says here that's not a writ petition. No, I don't think that's going to happen. No, oh, no, it wasn't because of this, that, the other. This pretty much covers it. I can imagine all the different things that they have said over the years. This will cover it. If you need some words other than 
it's a fresh pair of eyes. It's not a fresh pair of eyes. If there's anything that you should know leaving this room, the writ is not a fresh pair of eyes. It's a weary set of eyes. Weary set of eyes, deferential to the trial court set of eyes. It is not fresh, and we're not looking to, to win your case. So please, when your client is down, and you are down and out, and you're looking to say something to either lift them up and move them on down the hall to the lobby of the elevator. <laughs> Don't say, it's a fresh pair of eyes. Because you're, you're actually doing your client a disservice. It's not a fresh pair of eyes. OK, 109. Non-statutory way. OK, so these are the hot writs. We talk about them as hot writs, emergency writs, non-statutory writs. There is nothing in the law that allows these kinds of writs. No. Why? Because the Court of Appeal is busy. They have a docket. They're getting appeals from criminal court. They're getting appeals from family law. And we're talking about complex cases. It's not to say that our cases are not complex, but complex cases nonetheless. Death penalty cases, regular statutory appellate work. Hot writ. We're just, excuse me, Court of Appeal, excuse me, <laughs> may, may, just, may I interrupt? This happened, Th this happened, please review it, please review it. Something really serious happened. N no, not that serious. <laughs> not, no, we have a full on docket. It better be urgent. It better be exigent circumstances. It better be so severe that if we don't step in now, the rest of the juvenile dependency proceeding is completely screwed for your client. Your client's due process rights will never, ever be supported unless we step in. That's an emergency writ. So it is not, you argued release of detention and loss. It's not that. It's not your client didn't get the report within 10 days. It's not the court suspended visitation after the department filed a 385 petition pending the jurisdictional hearing. It's not the court set the status review hearing in three months instead of six months, but you're already 15 months into the case. Okay, that's not a hot writ. Okay, a hot writ, just, just so that you know. You wanna say something like this after you hear the order. That is the craziest writ I have ever heard. <laughs> I can't believe that writ. <laughs> there is no way the court could have done that writ. <laughs> okay? That is what you should be feeling inside of you when you're thinking emergency writ. Now, what do you do? Fortunately, there is a checklist. Okay? Now, when we are opposing an emergency writ, this is when DCFS, they file their, their writ to stay the order, releasing the child to your, your client. Just do this checklist. You have a resource attorney in your office to whom you can refer these things to, but if you follow these particular items on this list, you should be good with opposing, or at least your firm will be good in terms of opposing the hot writ from DCFS. But I think maybe more importantly, if you want to file the writ, if you want to file the writ, the situation is so <clears throat> urgent that on the very same day, you got to pull this out. On the very same day, you must pull this out and start going through it. I sent an email to my law firm designated resource attorney on the same day the order was made. I included in my email a description of the court's order. I included in my email a description of the governing legal authority. A lot of you guys skipped that one. You don't want to say what, what section it was or what CCP section it was or family code section this was. They'll get it. You're the attorneys. You're the resource attorneys. Come on, I want to hear it. What legal issue was it? What was the WIC code section? Because without that, not writing it. 
because time is of the essence. I gotta get that thing going. I gotta put myself in front of the computer. Gotta start typing it out. We don't have any time. Okay, and I included in my email a chronology of everything that was said, both on and off the record. This checklist goes on and on and on. Follow it to the letter. Because time is of the essence. And why is time of the essence? Because here are the responses from the Court of Appeal. Okay, my favorite is from <clears throat> least favorite to most favorite. They say the order or they say the hearing and they ask for the briefing schedule. Oh, great. I get a chance to brief them? Fantastic. Whew. When? 10 a.m. 10 a.m. on June 15th. Oh, God. It's so fast, guys. The turnaround is so fast. They'll do and say whatever they need to say to resolve it and get it off their docket. Why? Because they have another whole docket schedule, and it does not include your emergency room. They need to move it. Okay? Another one. They're asking for a briefing schedule, but they also are explaining that the court needs to vacate or change their order. So it's a little complicated. You have to read it a little more. But in any event, you got to understand it so that you can give the court whatever it is they need before they make their final decision. And they want it as fast as possible. So this one was an, alter an alternative writ where they give the court a choice. You need to change this order or you need to come on down here and show us why we shouldn't change it for you. And then they give us a briefing schedule. And you can also type up a little something quickly and they give you the date and time. All right, here's another one. No briefing schedule and no explanation whatsoever. Denied. Denied. No explanation. Nothing. You don't even know why. They just don't want to hear it. Okay? You don't want to hear it. I don't know. Maybe they didn't like your issue. Maybe they figured you figured out on appeal. It wasn't hot enough. It wasn't urgent enough. Sometimes they give you a case citation. Your petition is denied for failure to demonstrate entitlement to extraordinary relief. Here's the case why. Look it up. You know, kind of snarky, but hey, at least it gives us direction. It's, it's better than just denied. Okay. This one has an explanation, kind of, kind of very direct. Although there is substantial evidence to support the jurisdiction and detention of the children, the juvenile court has discretion to weigh the competing evidence based on its own credibility determinations and observations in court. We cannot say the juvenile court exceeded its authority. And this one is my favorite. The court has ready to through the petition. The petition is denied for latches. <laughs> latches? What's latches? Does anybody remember what latches is? Time. Time. Okay. Petitioner waited to file his petition until over two months after the challenge continuance was entered, and six weeks after his party objection was overruled. Moreover, the petition was filed only six hours before the six-month timeline. Petitioner relies on expired. Denied. So those are some of the examples of why if you're going to want to file a hot writ, an emergency writ, a non-statutory writ, you got to get to that checklist. you got to knock out all of those items as fast as possible. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. If you've got questions, we'll follow up with you later.